Good morning, everybody. I um, hope you can hear me at the back. I'll have to talk very slowly because I'm Scouse and we tend to go 100 miles an hour. Um, so I will, if I go too slow, I do apologise. I've been working in the NHS as a tissue viability nurse now for 19 years. And over them years, we've seen numerous um, practices and protocols implemented in a strive to reduce pressure ulcers. Some years ago, uh, what we did see was following the introduction of uh, profile and bed frames, our incidence of heel pressure ulcers started to meet the incidence of sacral ulcers, and in fact, in recent years, has actually overtook them in our trust, despite all the protocols in place, the air mattresses, the repositioning, the skincare regime, etc., etc. And our average age of our patients ranges from 65 to 75. Sir Helens and Nosley is one is the third uh, most deprived um, region in the UK. We have a high incidence of cancers, lung disease, um, and patients with lots of comorbidities. So, of course, at any one point in our trust, between 60 and 70 patients are actually deemed at risk of pressure ulcers. Why is the heel more at risk? Well, I think the previous speakers have gone into that in some detail. Um, and really, the practices for preventing heel ulcers is relatively a new concept. Previously, we were seeing pressure ulcers from pressure. That is, patients lying in one place for too long. Very little thought was given to the superficial type of friction wounds. Um, and we didn't have a lot of armory or any tools to combat that. Um, so while we seem to have got the gist of reducing true pressure ulcers from pressure through protocols of repetitioning, good skin care, better equipment, profiling beds, lower last mattresses, etc., etc., friction has been really a hidden part of, of, of pressure ulcer uh, prevention, in my opinion. As I say, year on year, we were seeing our heel incidence pressure ulcer increase. And these were pressure ulcers from friction and shear. These were grade two pressure ulcers, mainly blisters. And our protocol at that time, our only protocol we had for protecting heels along with the mattresses and repositioning was to apply a film dressing to provide a barrier between the skin and whatever surface the patient was on. This is not an excellent picture, but it does give you, at the edges, you can see the problem we had. It wasn't effective at all. We were putting the film dressings on, and within hours, it was shearing off. Um, and usually that was because the patient was moving around the bed or digging the heels in. This is a picture taken from a paper written by Jackie Fletcher last year, which is really helpful. And what it demonstrates is, even without nursing intervention, just the patient profile in the bed to sit up drags the heel by 11 centimetres across the surface of the bed. And we felt that that was the causative factors for our grade two pressure ulcers. Up until that point, we'd had an ineffective uh, regime of applying film dressings, which was costly. And it was also the drag effect of the film and the adhesives was caused was not helpful either. So there wasn't really any tool we had to prevent these blisterings other than patient education and appropriate use of the profile in beds. When the Parafrit de Booty came along, we were very interested in trialing this product because I personally felt there was a piece of the jigsaw missing with regards to heel pressure ulcers and friction was the key. So in 2011, we looked at our pressure ulcers and we recorded and separated them out from locality and heels. We looked at the uh, low fabric booty and we introduced the booty into the trust for all at risk patients. And that was a major undertaking. It was a brand new technology. It was another intervention nurses had to think about and they had to look better at their patients. The risk assessment tools at the moment, very few look at friction and shear as a risk factor. It's always down to mobility. And as the previous speaker said, if their risk assessment is low, then that's end of. Very little skin assessments are done. 
The risk assessments are often done at the nurse's station. How do they know whether they're moving around in the bed, whether they're digger in, digging their feet in? So the risk assessment tools I've found in my clinical experience don't help with friction-related blisters on the heels. One of the biggest incidents was in our orthopaedic unit and our biggest uh, incident was in fractured neck of femur patients who typically were using their good foot to push off the bed. So we introduced the booties in 2012. We did provide training at that point. In 2013, we looked at our training issues and um, if you're not aware, in the UK, tissue viability is, and pressure ulcer prevention is not mandatory for trusts. So we approached our director and nurse and said if we want to make a significant impact, we need to provide training. So we made training in tissue viability mandatory. So people have to attend one hour session um, once a year. In 2014, we looked at a new risk assessment tool, which specifically identified which patients were suitable for the parafric debuti. It's an 880 bedded uh, hot trust, so we couldn't afford to be, um, you know, issuing these booties willy nilly to every patient. So we had to have some form of um, identity and risk to demonstrate who are these booties going to be for, who are they going to be most effective in. We looked at the risks and the literature uh, involved and we picked out 11 categories. Most of them categories were identified through Joyce Black's work and we developed a protocol. Any patient with one of the risks was allocated a low fat fabric booty alongside the other preventative protocols, so things like an air mattress, etc. And then the heels were regularly assessed. We monitored the incidence of pressure ulcers monthly and then we broke it down as by location. And then we started to compare it with the baseline, which was 2011 figures. As in most trusts, we do a root cause analysis for all grade two, three, and four pressure ulcers. And we identified that the cost to heal in these pressure ulcers was extortionate, 500, you know, plus thousands of pounds. We looked at the cost of the low fabric booty and what the laundering costs were, because these weren't single patient use, these were multi-use uh, booties. And we looked at the changes in our incidence of hospital acquired pressure ulcers. And this is a graph which demonstrates the changes we've seen locally over the uh, period of the study. So in the top box, you can see our admissions. We're a very busy trust um, with, you know, hundreds of thousands of admissions per year. As I said, the epidemiology and um, the comorbidities involved in these patients is very high uh, for the UK. And this just shows you all our pressure ulcers in the red line. So that is a pressure ulcer anywhere, including the sacrum, etc. And then we've broken it down to just the heels, which is the red line. And what you can see is year on year, we had a significant reduction across all pressure ulcers, but more significantly across the heel pressure ulcers. And this table shows just some cost analysis with regards to how we implemented the low fat fabric paraphric booties, how much did it cost, how much potentially did it save us. We took into a fact and account both the cost of the product, but also the laundry costs um, as well. And as you can see, there's significant savings alongside a significant reduction in our heel pressure ulcers. By 2012, we'd reduced our heel blistering uh, with the fabric booties by 32% alongside the training. And after the five years, we had an 84% reduction in grade two uh, blistering events on the heel. What are the implications for that locally and both for the NHS uh, as well? It's now become a standard of care in our trust and in order to meet the avoidability on a book ability argument in heel pressure ulcers, they had to have had the parafricta booty in place. And my argument is that this is the missing link. When you look in a, um, are, is a pressure ulcer avoidable or unavoidable? How can we say a pressure ulcer was unavoidable when we haven't looked at one of the main causative factors, which is friction and shear? Just putting someone on a, pre on a mattress and repositioning eliminates some of the risk, but unless we start raising the bar and using strategies to reduce friction and shear, in my 
um, opinion. We can't argue pressure also was unavoidable. So there is some connotations for that. The staff education and training will have impacted as well, obviously, because they will have learned about the heel, which is not necessarily in all training, and they'll have heard about all the other implications. And it will have been the first time everybody in the trust will have had this training. Unless they've gone to a specific study day or have had an interest in the topic, they may not have had any tissue viability training at all. We had a major focus on heels. So previously, where we were having RCAs around pressure ulcers, we were finding the skin checks were predominantly on the sacrum and the buttocks, and the staff weren't checking the heels. That changed. And we had a focus on friction and shear, not just pressure alone. We had an inspection with CQC in 2016, and they picked up on the practice of trying to eliminate and providing a solution for friction. Um, and we were one of the first tissue viability teams to gain an outstanding practice um, in the comments section for our report. The incidence has reduced and remains below the national average. And our figures are mirrored and uh, the reliability of the data is backed up through the safety thermometer data as well. And it has significant clinical and financial and economic potential within the NHS. This is the protocol uh, that we introduced locally in our trust in 2012. And as you can see, it shows you based on the risk, what uh, mattress to use and what tools to employ. But on the left hand section, it's got them 11 higher risk factors for those patients that have been deemed more at risk for heel pressure ulcers in the literature. And then the picture shows you the beauty and the sizing guide. And these are on all the wards at the Trust. The company are looking at producing a flow chart. Um, there is a lot of products on the market, a lot of variability, and staff do get confused. If they've got a score of this, what do we do? If they're red here, what do we do? So uh, the company, and this is a working document, it's not the final version, are looking at trying to implement a flowchart to educate and advise staff on when to apply the booty and what, where that fits in the whole uh, kit of what practices we use. Another thing that recently uh, we've employed is a mirror. Um, for staff, often patients are unable to roll or turn. It's very difficult to limb very edematous legs and regularly check the heel. So we've looked at in, uh, all the staff now wear um, this tag and it's got a mirror on it. So they're able to, to look and see the patient's pressure areas as well. And the heels are one of them more difficult areas to inspect in some areas. Thank you. 